In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Can you hear me? If you can't, you could go to sleep. <laughs> but I have a cane, and I could send somebody to tap you gently on the head. This is a wonderful occasion for me. I was ordained in this church on March 10th of 1991. There are people here who were here. Is there any, who is here for my ordination? Look at it. Yes. Now, by now, I'm obviously the Ancient of Days. But it's very good to be back here at St. Thomas. It's a privilege. So, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Lord is risen hallelujah. That's it. We may as well go home, but don't. <laughs> My nephew is an organist in a Lutheran church, and recently a longtime member asked him, does Easter occur on Sunday this year? Yes. But it was on Sunday last year. Yes. Is that woman a bit a tad confused about Easter? Is she the only one who's confused about Easter? Now I live in Sherwood Oaks, where all is decorum and good taste, but my mind goes back to where I lived a year ago at Easter time, and I want you to, in your imagination, walk through that neighborhood with me, and you'll say, oh, no, we're not going to do that. We know that was Beaver Falls, and there's nobody there except uneducated mill hands. Okay, in my neighborhood, you would have seen the mayor of the town, the richest man in the town, the president of Geneva College, numerous faculty and staff people from Geneva College, and professionals of all type. That's, that's the neighborhood. So we're going to walk through and see what we see about Easter. Well, for one thing, ah, we see a pink, pink plastic bunny hanging from a roof. Okay. Then we see another bunny hanging by one ear from a gate. And in another yard, six pink bunnies. And next to it, a yard with 50 bunnies of varying sizes and colors. Got the picture? And on one house, a banner, a, pur a purple banner with a gold crown and cross and the message, he is risen on one house. But there it is. The bunnies and the banner. Which is it this morning? A banner signals victory. A banner says the king is in residence. The bunny says nothing except, oh, yeah, you called Amazon and found me. That's the bunny. So, beyond the neighborhood, there are other signs that Easter is confused by people. Um, for one thing, there's a lot of travel. Lots of people get in the cars and go to visit somebody on Easter. Uh, <clears throat> then, in some families, piles of gifts. Everybody exchanges gifts at Easter time. Clearly, the United States of America is bunny time, not, be, not banner time. Amazon and Hallmark have hijacked our holiest of days, and we have let them do it. Picture the word holy day. What letter is in the middle? S speak. Why? For Yahweh. Picture the word holiday. What letter is in the middle? What has happened to the Y? Come on, speak. Yeah, now it's all about me. And so, 
part of the confusion about Easter may arise from the fact that it's a springtime event. So if you're a little fuzzy about the reality of Easter, or simply don't believe it in, it's easy to murmur good feeling sentiments about grass getting green and little flowers coming up, and isn't this beautiful, all this natural stuff happening, and the resurrection of Christ. And that was the most unnatural thing that has ever occurred in human history. It's the great reversal from the time when God said to the human beings, if you do this, you'll die. Now the great reversal has occurred, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not the spirit of Jesus, not the essence of Jesus, not what one writer has called it, the myth of the Mediterranean imagination. Yeah. This is an occasion for banners, not bunnies. But in the grand scheme of things, which is such a foundation of our whole belief system, it's sometimes hard to translate that into practical day-to-day -day living. But we're going to do it by going through the gospel of the day with Mary Magdalene. Why? Because Mary is the only person mentioned in this, and if we walk with Mary, we will realize that the cosmically important event is also a very personal event. Now, she's the only one that John mentions, though Matthew, Mark, and Luke are careful to tell us that there are other women there. But we're just going to go with Mary as if she's the only one. And that will help us realize how a cosmic event is really also a personal event. Now, Mary has been one of the disciples of Jesus almost from the beginning. She was one of the group of women who traveled with him and the Twelve and supported them out of the women's own resources. She was at the cross. She saw Jesus die. She saw his body wrapped in spices. By the way, uh, there are people who say that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just fainted. And then when they put him in the cool tomb, he revived. I will tell you that the spices for burial varied from 75 to 100 pounds and yards and yards and yards and yards of cloth wrapping up the body. So if Jesus had just fainted, which he didn't, Roman soldiers knew dead when they saw it, believe me. Uh, he would have been suffocated by the wrappings anyway. So if you ever hear anybody say that, he didn't really die, he just fainted, and then he got up and you can say, no, 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 couldn't have done it. Okay, now Mary goes home to observe the Sabbath in what must have been the saddest day of her life. Early in the morning, while it was yet dark, sort of like when I got up this morning, she comes to the tomb. Can you imagine her mood? She is grieving. She is hopeless. She expects nothing. Jesus is dead. She comes in the same mood that I go to my parents' graves sometimes and put flowers on. I certainly do not expect to see my father and mother standing there. And if their graves were empty, I would assume they had been vandalized, and that's exactly what Mary thinks, that somebody has gone and stolen the body of Jesus. So she runs to Peter and John, tells them, you heard this in the gospel reading, they run, they go and see for themselves, yes, it is empty. Totally devastated, they go home, as the text says, because they did not yet realize, understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. But Mary stays. She is fatigued. She is crying. She goes over and peers once more into the tomb. It's not empty. Two angels are there. Angels appearing to Mary. And they say, why are you weeping? And she says, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Well, she averts 
her glance, and she sees a figure standing there. Now, critics of Christians, critics say that she should have recognized Jesus if that were Jesus. She would have known it immediately. Wait a minute. It's barely dawn. She's crying. Her eyes are averted. She just sort of sees there's a figure out there. And she does not expect to see Jesus. So, he asks her a question. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Using very good English grammar, by the way. Did you notice that? Whom are you seeking? How gracious our Lord is. He could have scared her out of her wits. He could have had the blast of trumpet angels with trumpets. And what he does is ask her questions. Now look, friends, he is not asking for information. He knows perfectly well why she's weeping. And he knows whom she is seeking. He doesn't ask for information. He is asking to give her the dignity of answering the questions and articulating her feelings, speaking for herself. So, she thinks he's a kindly gardener. And so she says, sir, they have carried him away. Can you tell me where they've laid him so that I can come and get him and take him away? Really? How would the world would she do that? It's very obvious that her mind is not yet, she's not thinking clearly. Again, friends, notice how gracious Jesus is. He does not say, oh, cheer up. Lots of people are worse off than you are. He doesn't say, count your blessings. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you, you faithless wimp? He doesn't say, how can you even ask after all I've done for you? No. He says one word. What is it? What is it? He speaks her name. Mary. That does it. That does it. No one else sounds like that. There he is. He is risen. No more mourning. Joy. Deep joy. She clutches him. He says, uh, don't hold on to me. Now, in the old King James Version, which many of us were brought up with, he says, don't touch me. That's not a good translation. The translation really is, don't hang on to me. You use it, the, the tense, for something that's already going on. Like as when you say to a child, quit fooling with your food. He says, don't hang on to me. Why not? He's trying to convey to Mary that the old patterns have been changed. He is no longer teacher, just teacher and companion. This is a new age. They're in a new relationship, not worse but better than the old relationship. He is the risen Lord. He's going to ascend into heaven and take his hand at the right place at the right hand of the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Jesus our Lord does a radical thing. He says, go and tell my brothers. Brothers, those are the guys that all ran away from him in his greatest hour of need. Now he is going to ascend and be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he speaks to those, about those guys as brothers. He hasn't forgotten them. He has forgiven them. And they are still in his plans. But the most radical thing that Jesus does is to make Magdalene his messenger. Now remember, this is first century Palestine. 
where a rabbi was not allowed to speak to a woman in public, much less make her a disciple. Where the word of a woman in a court had to be backed up by a man or it wasn't considered to be valid. Now, he commissions her to go and tell Peter and John that he's risen. Cultural norms would demand that he would tell them and then tell them to tell her. But no, he commissions her to testify to the fact that he is risen. The old times are over. All the old relationships are up for grabs now. It's different. It's a different time. Christ has risen. She has become now the apostle to the apostles. And she was known as such by the early church and today by the Orthodox churches. I have an icon in my living room of Mary Magdalene instructing the apostles. She's standing there. They're over here. Let me tell you guys, it's very clear. This, her testimony is, I have seen the Lord. This is not bunny talk. This is banner talk. The good news is that Jesus Christ is risen and that we, like Mary Magdalene, can meet him. If you're listening, and I'm listening, we can hear him speak our name. He is so gracious. He will not belittle us. He will not trivialize our feelings. And he will not scold us. He will say, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Fear not. I have called you by name. Follow me. So that no longer how messy or painful or disappointing your life may have been. Nothing, no power on heaven or earth can defeat you. Say amen. amen. Yeah. That's it. That's the importance of the resurrection. So, what's our next step? He says the same thing to us as he said to Mary Magdalene. Go and tell people the Lord is risen. Who? Us? You? Me? Yes. All of us. Just outside our doors, there lies a world which is full of gaudy, hollow bunnies. Actually, I believe that in America today, we are back to the first century, where believers are a minority in a hostile environment. So it's up to us to do what Mary Magdalene did to say, I have seen the risen Lord. That's the good news. Christ is risen. Remember, just outside that door, there's a confused world pumping up bunnies, plastic, hollow, cheap bunnies. The world needs a banner. Let's be banner bearers. The king is victorious. The king is alive. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.